Hi there, and happy Good Friday. I'm Jamie Hampton, and um, no matter how many times I say that, I can't really get used to happy Good Friday because of what we're commemorating, the suffering and the death of Jesus. I think each of my children at some point in their lives have come to me and asked in different ways, like, why do we call this Good Friday when Jesus died and suffered? What's good about that? And I think what I've come to realize and what I've come to tell them over the years and, and understand myself is that it's because we know the big picture. We know the end of the story now. And so we can call it good because we can see what God is doing and what God did through that suffering and through that death, that he brought about abundant life in a way that never could have happened without that death. But at the same time, so when every Good Friday, I come to this sort of looking in the mirror at my own life through the lens of Good Friday and, and its context in, in terms of like the whole Easter story. And so I look at the fact that in my own life, and I'm sure in your life it's true, there are things that even knowing that God is good, that I can't look back and say, wow, that thing in and of itself was good like plucked out of the story, that thing is good. So for instance, when I look at the story of Good Friday, when I read in the Bible about Jesus being betrayed by his best friend, um, being one of his best friends, being abandoned by other best friends, being tortured, being mocked, being persecuted and whipped and beaten, those things are not good. Like there's nothing in the end that I can look back and say those individual things were good. Um, realistically, I don't know how it could have all worked. Um, I know that there, God has purposes, but I think scripturally, it seems like Jesus could have probably just died on the cross and not gone through some of those other things, and we could have been saved. I mean, that's, that's my speculation. Um, and I think it like that, and that's my human perspective, right? I'm not God. And obviously, God has purpose in everything. And, and the Bible does talk about through Jesus' sufferings, he experienced suffering as part of his humanity to be able to identify with our suffering and for us to know that we have a Savior, we have a high priest who is not a stranger to suffering. So that is part of God's plan. Um, but there are things in our own lives. I think of things that have happened to me, things that have happened to people I love, things that are happening even now in places that I've never been that just are terrifying to me when I think about um, just the things that are going on and just heartbreaking to know that people are suffering these kinds of things. So those things in our lives that we see happening that are taken out of context even maybe if they're taken in context of a greater good, there are still things that are painful, things that we might not be able to say, wow, that is good, that's really good, and that's great. But what we can do, and I think what, what Good Friday teaches us in its title, in its name, as well as in what it stands for and what it was and is, is that we can look at something that looks bad and we can see past it. We can be looking at something bad, but what we can be seeing is something good. We can be seeing not that that thing in and of itself is good, but that God is good and God promises he's in it. And we don't know how or why or what the outcome will be, but he is there and he is good. So we can say it is well, it is well with my soul. And so I just like looking at Good Friday sort of through this lens and looking forward to Easter and the resurrection because really no matter what is happening in our own lives up until the point of death, that's not the end. And I think that is the ultimate goodness of Good Friday is because of Jesus dying and taking the sin of the world upon himself on the cross and paying the price as the perfect lamb, the unblemished, perfect lamb of God, dying to pay the price for those sins. Because he did that, there is resurrection. There, there would be no resurrection if there was no death. And so because of Jesus, we can look beyond the circumstances of this life, and we can see that, okay, maybe I'll never see justice served in this area 
in this life, but God promises there is ultimate justice. Or maybe I don't see an end to pain in this area of my life or someone else's life in this world, but there's another life that's so much fuller and longer and more lasting and eternally lasting than this one. And that pain will be gone. There will be redemption of that pain. There will be restoration and wholeness and completion. And that is what we're looking toward. I think it's kind of neat. Um, This scripture that I wanted to read was from Matthew 27, and it's about the death of Jesus. I'm just going to read it because it really was relevant after I heard this read on a radio station earlier today, and it's very relevant for something that happened today. Um, Matthew 27, verses 45 through 54. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. So the thing that struck a chord with me today as I was driving, and I I heard this from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came all over the land, came over all the land. Um, So I live in Anchorage, Alaska, where we've had some really like unseasonably spring-like weather for the last week. We've had you know, just great temperatures, sunshine. It's been gorgeous. The the snow is all but gone, and the kids have been loving it. They've been outside. They've been playing basketball and riding bikes and playing, you know, rollerblades and everything else. And today, the, the last couple of days, we've had a little bit of snow and they were a little disappointed. But today we had like four to five inches. I mean, like the kind of snow you have to clear your car off and turn it on for 20 minutes before you leave to make sure that all the ice is off of it. And so um, the kids woke up this morning and saw that, and my kids love snow. I mean, they they wait for the snow to come in the fall, and um, they were so mad. They they were just like, we thought spring was here, <laughs> and they were just so uh, so angry and upset that the snow had come, which is very uncharacteristic for them. So you know they were enjoying the spring. But it was really funny because I I was thinking about this. I was thinking that that is what Jesus' disciples and his followers, not just the 12 or the 11, but all of them were experiencing this feeling. When Jesus died on Good Friday, they had, they had had hope. They had had a season where they believed in something beyond themselves, something that they would eventually stake their lives on, something that um, they didn't understand fully. Maybe they thought that he was coming to liberate them politically or maybe religiously. I don't know, but I just know that they didn't fully understand it, but they had hope. They knew he was special. They believed he was the son of God. They believed he was there for a great purpose and spring had come. They were convinced that that there was hope in Jesus. And it was just like this unexpected five-inch snowfall that we got overnight here when he died because they were shocked. They had gotten used to the idea of spring. They had gotten used to the idea of deliverance and hope. And all of a sudden it was taken away from them and they didn't know what to do. And they were disappointed. They were heartbroken. Um, And those words probably don't even express the extent of what they were feeling at that time. Hopeless, despair. Um, 
and they just they didn't understand so that reminded me of what we woke up to today but then I had run a friend over to drop her off somewhere and I did a few errands and went in the store. And when I came out, all of a sudden, I mean, this morning, the sky was overcast. It was dark. It was snowy. It was snowing this morning, like big, big, huge flakes of snow. The roads were slushy. I came out of the store and it was bright. It felt like spring and there was no snow on the ground anymore. I mean, it was like it had just gone away. Like there was an hour of, of time that passed and the snow had just gone. And I thought back to this quote from Matthew 27, from noon until three, darkness came over all the land. So as soon as I came out, I thought, well, it must be three o'clock <laughs> because the darkness had left. The darkness had lifted. So that darkness lifted the moment Jesus died. So it was like the darkness was in his suffering. The darkness was in his death. But then the moment he died, it was like there was hope. The sun came back out. And it wouldn't fully be revealed until Sunday morning when the tomb was empty. But that was the beginning of the hope. His death was the beginning of something new. And that just, you know, the sun coming out reminded me of that a little bit. Like, okay, we had this dark time. We had this snowy hiatus of spring, but spring is coming and spring will soon be here. So um, another really neat thing that I got from this passage, though, that has always been exciting to me since I did, um, I did a study through Bible study fellowship about the temple and, um, I guess it actually it was a study of Matthew, I think. And it got to this part about the, um, the curtain of the temple being torn in two from top to bottom. And it was so neat because they explained, and you probably already know this, but I'm going to just explain it because I love it. Um, I love all of the symbolism of this time in scripture where there's so much hearkening back to the Old Testament. There's so much looking forward at, at Christ's return. And just um, all of the fulfillment of prophecy coming together at the end of Jesus' life and the beginning of the church. Um, I just, I love it. So anyway, but I digress. So I'm going to get back to the, the temple. Um, so the curtain of the temple was torn into from top to bottom. So in this study that I was in through Bible Study Fellowship, we did some studying about the temple and the Holy of Holies. And so... The curtain was the curtain that separated the inner courts, I guess, I might be getting this wrong, of the temple from the Holy of Holies. What I do know is the Holy of Holies was a place that could only be entered one time a year by the high priest and only after just tremendous ceremonial cleansing to prepare his heart for this time and to prepare his body, ceremonial washing. And I believe they even tied a cord to his ankle or foot so that if he fell dead, if he had not prepared himself properly and he fell dead before God, the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, he could be dragged out so no one had to go in there because he was the only one allowed there. And the presence of God was said to dwell there. And God was said to meet with this high priest only as he made the sacrifices for atonement for his people every year. So. Here's this Holy of Holies. No one can see it, but this high priest only once a year for this special sacrifice. And it's not a small curtain. What I would picture is kind of like when you go to vote, how there's like a little curtain that goes across. That's kind of what I always pictured was just this little curtain and this guy would go behind it and, you know, you might not be able to see what he's doing. That wasn't it. I want to say I, I was doing some reading about it and they said it could have been up to 60 feet tall. Um, tradition, not necessarily in the Bible, but Jewish tradition states that the curtain may have been as thick as four inches thick. I mean, like thickness. Um, so this wasn't a small curtain. This was not your voting booth curtain <laughs> or your kid's valance on their window. This is not something that your kid could take their kid scissors and snip through or even your best sewing scissors and snip through. This was not easy to tear. And the other really symbolic thing about it being torn from top to bottom, 
it was so tall. It's not like someone's going to, you know, climb up there. Now, my son, I have to say, my very creative 13-year-old said, well, what if it was like in the movies sometimes where they go on a balcony with a sword and jump and like stick their sword in the curtain and it, anyway, you get the picture. I doubt that's what happened. I think the symbolism is that God himself tore the curtain from top to bottom to symbolize that Jesus himself was now our high priest. And there was no separation between us and God. And in fact, Hebrews 10, 19 and 20 says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body. Oh my, oh my goodness. I mean, that is... We have confidence we can enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new way, a living way opened for us through the curtain. That curtain symbolizes his body. His body was broken. And when his body broke, he opened the door for being right with God. And if that doesn't just get you, I don't know what will. And I, I love this. I love this picture and this symbolism that takes us into what God did. So on Good Friday, I love to hope to Sunday, but I also, there's part of me that wants to linger in the pain, not to glorify the pain, but because I just feel like it gives me a taste of what Jesus really did. It just gives me um, a little bit of a picture of the extent of his love. I mean, he was, in, he was at the right hand of God before the creation of the world. He was the one through whom nothing was made that was made. He was there. So he was existing, pre-existing with God the Father. And the Bible tells us he chose to step down. He didn't regard being with God in heaven something to, to hold on to or to cling to. He chose because he loved us. God gave his son because he loved us. God's son gave himself because he loves us. And so that's an amazing picture for me. And when I see through scripture and through meditation and, and just thinking about Good Friday and what Jesus went through for us, for me, it helps me to understand just how much I've been forgiven and just how much he loves me. And I think that prepares me to be so much more equipped to extend that love to others and to extend that grace to others. So what I want to do today in light of this is not wallow in our sinfulness. I don't want to rend our garments and just wail for the sake of wailing. I don't want that. I don't think God wants that. But what he does want is repentance and and not for the sake of feeling bad but for the sake of moving forward so what i like to picture is that i'm standing in a jail cell and the door is closed and i'm in bondage to this sinful way of living these sinful thoughts sinful words sinful actions and when i confess when God gives me a mirror and lets me see the things that are not of him, that are not his best for me, that are not going to result in abundant life for myself or others, I all of a sudden am enlightened to the fact that this jail cell was never locked, that I was just standing in it because maybe it's comfortable, standing in it maybe because the enemy deceived me into thinking I had to and I had no choice, but um, but it's a revelation. It's freedom from bondage. That's what I love about confession. And confession is a type of prayer. And it's something Alana and I have talked a lot about. But it's something that I want to lead us through today. And the way I want to do it is I'm doing this for myself. But I thought, you know, why not share it? Why not put it out there so other people that might want to also get contemplative and kind of um, prepare their hearts for Easter? might want to do this too. Um, so I just thought I'd put it out there. But, um, but Alana and I have talked about this a lot and how freeing it is, but how scary it can be to jump into. 
right now it's just you and me. You're not with someone else. I can't hear your own confessions. It's just you and Jesus. He's your high priest that you confess to. It's just you and God. But um, it, I think it's also important to have someone that you can do this with regularly that, that you can actually confess to, that can hold you accountable, that can ask you questions back. Because I can't ask you specific questions back. Um, but for now, I think this is a good, a good way to start if you haven't done this. Or if you've done it a million times, let's just do it together to be able to stand before God with humble hearts, just being grateful for the extent of his love and mercy and, and making our hearts right, preparing our hearts to receive the resurrected Jesus. I'm going to break this down into three parts. So part one is going to be um, confession of thoughts, sinful thoughts, because I think that's where all sin begins is in our thoughts. And Jesus himself said things like, you know, if you lust after a woman in your heart, it's as if you've already done the deed in real life. If you have a uh, hatred towards someone or if you um, speak bad words against them and, you know, curse them with your words, it's as if you've murdered them, which is hard teaching and it seems harsh. But I think it's almost intended to do the opposite. It's, it's, it's I think, intended to show us sin is sin. Don't ju judge that person over there for acting on something that, that you know was in your heart too. Um, and I'm not going to get into a discussion. I know there is a difference between thinking something and doing it. We do have to use self-control. We need to take responsibility for our actions. But the Bible is very clear that we need to confess our thoughts as well as our words, as well as our actions. So that's what I'm going to break it down into is thoughts, words, and actions. And I'm just going to leave room. I'm, I'm going to probably just talk through my own heart. And if anything resonates with you, that's great. I'm also going to leave some blank space for you to be able to just talk with God and let him reveal things in your own heart. And feel free to pause at any time if you just need some time on your own. Um, so yeah, let's pray. Father God, we just come before you right now with hearts that are overwhelmed by your goodness and your love and what you were willing to sacrifice for us while we were still sinners, while we were still your enemies, while we were still against you. You sacrificed your son your only son, your perfect son. And you didn't just sacrifice him to a clean death. You sacrificed him to live a painful life, a lonely life, a life of being misunderstood, a life of being questioned by religious leaders who claimed to be your people, a life that, um, where he was rejected by his own brothers and sisters at times, where he was called crazy, where he was chased, he was persecuted, and where he was eventually captured, betrayed by one of his own, abandoned by many of his own, tortured, mocked, and eventually died. Father, thank you. Whatever it is in us that can express gratitude in a way that goes beyond thank you, help us to do that, Lord. Help us to do that right now, to express our gratitude and our undying love for you because you first loved us. Father, we know that we have thoughts that do not glorify you, that there are thoughts that go through our minds that are sin. God, I confess that I have thoughts that tear others down where my words might be fine or where I might keep my mouth closed. I have thoughts that judge, that tear down, that ridicule, that hurt, that diminish. 
I have proud thoughts. Even though outwardly I can be very humble, I have proud thoughts. I feel superior to other people in ways that I would never express on the outside. And sometimes I even fool myself into thinking I'm humble. I confess those thoughts. I confess my thoughts against others. I confess judging others for things that I myself do and, and then some. I confess pride and arrogance. And I just pray for the humility that I would be able to see myself for who I am. That anything that I boast in would be boasting in Jesus and who I am in Christ. Father, reveal to us any other areas that our thoughts are displeasing to you. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts. Test us. Know our anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. Which brings me to my anxious thoughts. Father, I confess I have anxious thoughts. I have a lack of faith in your plans, in your purposes, in your sovereignty, even sometimes in whether you really care or even whether you really exist, if I'm honest. When things don't go my way after asking for them, I can doubt. I can worry. I can obsess. Please forgive me for my anxious thoughts. For the anxiety that that is just a, a warning that I'm not trusting you with my life, with the life of my children and my family and those that I love, with the world, with the church. Father, I lay that those anxious thoughts at your feet. And I pray that you would replace those anxious thoughts with the peace that transcends all understanding that would guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Seal off any cracks or crevices that might allow anxiety to creep in, Father, as only you can do. And give me hope and peace in who you are and what you can and will do. Father, we just acknowledge that there are words that come out of our mouths that are sinful, that tear down, that bring death and not life. If the tongue is a rudder, it steers us in the opposite direction from where you want us to go. Father, I just confess a lack of self-control with my tongue, with my words, in the way that I speak to my children, the words that I say when I don't think anyone is around to hear me, the words that I say to myself, the names I call myself that speak death, not life. Rebuking my children when they don't deserve it or speaking them to them in a way that, that isn't the way that you would want me to speak to them. Yelling instead of speaking in a quiet, direct way 
getting frustrated and saying things that I shouldn't instead of having the discipline to enforce consequences for actions immediately, for being angry with myself and taking it out on others, for being angry with life circumstances and taking it out on myself and others. Father, I confess my words. I just pray that you would help me to grow, that you would help me to speak life, speak positive words over my family, over the people that I come into contact with, over myself. I just pray for the fruit of self-control to be constantly growing in my life, Lord that I would be holy and set apart. I know that I cannot speak blessing out of one side of my mouth and cursing out of the other side of my mouth. Father, I just pray that you would uproot the negative and throw it into the fire, just burn it up so that I can speak your words and nothing else. We just pray that you would bring to mind any other words any specific instances of conversations with people or patterns that need to be broken in our, in our speech to each other, any gossip, any tearing down, any bullying, <laughs> adult bullying that might be going on in our lives or even in our homes. Bring to mind the things that we need to know, the things that we need to confess to you. And Father, finally, we lift up our actions. We just pray that whatever we do, that we would always filter those actions through your spirit, that we would order our priorities according to your desires, that when we even get close to the line between acceptable and unacceptable, that we would just immediately turn the other way, that we would flee from any hint of immorality. I pray for our marriages. I pray for interactions with the opposite sex, that you would protect our actions, that we would remain pure in thought, word, and deed in our marriages and keeping our marriages pure that we would always conduct ourselves with dignity and modesty and purity lord i pray for the way that we treat those who think or act or believe differently from us Father, I pray that you would help us to treat them with respect, to treat them with love, first of all, and be able to maintain our own beliefs without compromise, but in a way that showers them with the love of Jesus that he showed to everyone. I pray that that's how they will know whose we are, that we will stand out and be salt and light with the love that we show. Father, I pray that you would give us eyes to see the invisible, the ones that need our actions, that need the hands and feet of Jesus, but have slipped through the cracks. I pray that we would walk through our day-to-day and be prompted 
to act in love toward the people that need it most, whether it's ones that look like they need it the most or whether it's ones that look like they have it all together, God, that you would give us direction in our actions to be able to shepherd others just into your throne room, just to be examples of Jesus. Father, I pray that right now you would open our eyes, just bring to mind people that you need us to be intentional about showing the love of Jesus to in our own lives. God, I just pray that you would direct our actions toward our husbands, our children, our coworkers, those we work with in the body of Christ, church members, ministry team members, that you would just allow us to interact in a way that is pleasing to you, God. We just pray that you would open our eyes to any blind spots, any places where we are deceiving ourselves into thinking that we're acting like Christ would want us to, that you just bring a check in our spirit, that you would heighten our sensitivity and allow us to just walk as Jesus would walk. God, I confess that my actions are despicable to the people that I'm closest to. I'm the most short-tempered, the most um, the most unaware of the people I love the most. I neglect them, sometimes at the expense of others that aren't as important to me, for the sake of the approval of others. I confess that, Lord. Forgive me. Please allow me to see that in real time, not just during times of confession, but in real time, show me how I can serve my family and those that I love the most with everything that, that they need. God, we just pray that you would show us right now, open our eyes to any areas that we are not showing love or that we are not acting in a way that is pleasing to you whether it's in our families, in our workplace, in our churches. God, we thank you for this time. Father, we pray that you would hear our prayers that you would hear the confessions of our mouth and of our hearts, that you would receive them as an offering, as a sacrifice of praise to you. We want to burn all of the excess. We want the only thing to remain to be that kernel of self that comes from you, God, that regenerated spirit and the things that you have added unto us in our spirit by the blood of Jesus, that abundant life, that Christ-like character, the fruit of the spirit, those are the things we want to remain. And we offer all of the other. We just lay it at your feet, God. We place it on the altar. And we just pray that you would accept that as our humble offering of praise to you for who you are, and what you have done on this day, the sacrifice that was made for us. And we just pray, God, that, that we would enter into these next couple of days before Easter with clean hearts, with hearts that are ready to meet with Jesus, that are ready to receive that incredible gift. In Jesus' name, amen.